Good morning. Good morning to everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you for this uh, sixth edition of the ASTP EU Forum. Um, as you know, this forum uh, has now become a regular and successful uh, appointment for our community with a, a very large participation. So we are very happy about that, of course. Um, as you know, this is really a, a unique opportunity for our community to get to know uh, about the latest developments in policy, uh, policy areas which affect our jobs, uh, knowledge transfer and technology transfer. Um, in the last couple of years, um, the European Commission has been developing several policies and initiatives uh, related to knowledge valorization. And they are, of course, very relevant to our community. Um, and since uh, about three years, ASTP has developed a strategy to position itself in the EU arena with the aim uh, to become a stakeholder towards the, the European institutions in order to make the voice of our community heard at the best level of the Union. So we are now uh, organized and we have a, a vice president for Europe, thanks uh, dear Smirka, and we have also a very effective Europe committee. Um, so I would like to thank again all the volunteers sitting on this committee. Um, and this, I mean, the VP Europe and the Europe Committee are, are working very hard. Also, of course, in synergy with the National Association Committee, the NAC. Um, so they can actually together raise issues that are be relevant for the tech transfer community at the European level. And at the same time, um, these committees and uh, these volunteers also disseminate information uh, on new policies and new initiatives related to knowledge transfer. So at the end of October, for instance, there was an, an, an event organized by the DG uh, Research and Innovation um, as part of the Raising Awareness campaign on the new uh, guiding principles for knowledge valorization. And uh, ACP was present there with a booth and, um, and was also acknowledged as a natural and obvious stakeholder for the Commission. Um, now for today, so compared to previous forums, uh, these even will be uh, covering topics um, which um, KT professionals uh, should be really especially <laughs> aware of. Uh, so in particular, you will follow three sessions uh, moderated by uh, our dear ASTP colleagues, uh, Dr. Hanna Kosova, she's the director of the TTO at Charles University in Prague, so Czech Republic. And the second moderator will be uh, Dr. Henrik Redin, uh, our dear former ACP president and the uh, current director for external research at Volvo Cars in Sweden. Um, these three sessions will be dedicated to the following points. So the first one is about research management. Um, the, 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 the title of the session is um, Action 17, Research Management Initiative. And this is about enhancing the strategic capacity of public research in Europe um, uh, organizations. So this session will be focused on a very broad definition of research management, which also includes knowledge transfer and innovation. And that will be uh, covered and presented by Stein Delors from, uh, I said it in a French way, Delors, I don't know how to pronounce it uh, correctly. So Stein Delors from the DG uh, Research and Innovation. Uh, the second session will be dedicated to uh, the new European competence framework for researchers. And that, uh, interestingly, includes making impact. Um, this will be covered by Dario Capezzuto from the same DG, Research and Innovation. And finally, we will have uh, Claudia Martinez and uh, Jonas Hein from the DG GROW uh, to present the European patent package. And they will also talk about the new uh, union's uh, proposal on SEP, so the standard essential patents. And to me, these uh, three topics are uh, impacting actually our jobs and might be also enlarging our mission as TTOs. And I would say also that these topics probably need our expertise and the KT specialist uh, inputs. So there is a clear convergence of different stakeholders and there are also additional expectations um, <clears throat> that requests an increased engagement of our community, uh, therefore leading in return, this is what we hope, um, a better recognition of our efforts and our collective competence as uh, 
the, the, the network for the knowledge transfer. So, um, of course, uh, we hope that the session will be very interactive. So there will be questions and answers after each session and participants are welcome, of course, to post their questions in the chat. Um, as a conclusion, uh, the, the forum is a really a unique place and unique opportunity to interact and engage with the representatives of the European Commission, whom I would like really to thanks a lot to thank a lot for for their presence and their uh, interventions today. So please save your chance to interact with them, and I wish you a very fruitful forum. And I leave the floor now to Hannah uh, for the first session. Thanks a lot. All right, I see Stain is connected. I don't know if Hannah is going to introduce the session very briefly. Or should we start directly with the Stein? Hi, Stein. OK, Hannah is apparently disconnected at the moment, Christoph. So All right, so I, su I suggest then, um, as um, Anna has got some connection issues, that maybe Stein, I did a sort of introduction, so please, the floor is yours for this first session. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Christophe. It's uh, very good to be here. Um, let me share my screen. Give me a second. So I suppose you can see it if anyone can. Yeah, perfect. All right. I so I was invited to uh, your ASTP forum um, to explain you the background, policy background on ERA Action 17, which is uh, about research management. And I should say it is about research innovation management. Um, it is an action of the ERA policy agenda, um, which I will introduce you. I'm not aware of uh, how deep your knowledge is about ERA, uh, the European research area. So I will briefly introduce it before I explain uh, action uh, 17. Um, so the in 2020, the Commission uh, adopted a, a new a communication on the new European research area, which is uh, the idea, the concept of a single market for knowledge, where countries work together, uh, move for research innovation system forward, make them better, where there is free movement of both research as well as of knowledge and, and innovation. Now, uh, in 2021, the Council of Member States uh, adopted the Pact for Research Innovation, which outlines common principles and values for research innovation that all countries adhere to. It is about upholding these values, like the pursuit of excellence, uh, diversity, scientific freedom, and so on. It's also about working better together. Um, there is the, the pact includes a, a, a governance of member states and commission and stakeholders together, uh, how to get to this uh, single market for knowledge. The era exists for over 20 years at the moment, but after this pact, it, it is we see it moving uh, faster, uh, getting to this single market for knowledge. Now, the pact also outlines four priority areas where action is needed. This is about deepening the era. I will come back to this. It's about uh, making sure the twin transitions uh, get further. It's about improving access to excellence and about investments and reforms. Now, uh, the Council also decided on a first policy agenda for the period 22 to 24, which you see here. There are 20 actions decided along the four priority areas I mentioned, and several of them must uh, be quite known to you. It's about open science, about the reform of research assessment, about research careers, gender equality, inclusiveness, diversity, better knowledge valorization is an important one for ASTP, research infrastructures, uh, international cooperation, and so on. 
It's also about uh, empowering higher education institutions to develop in line with the era. And it's about amplifying access to research innovation excellence, where you have actions like Action 17, which aims to strengthen strategic capacity of public research performing organizations and research funding organizations. And that's the action I want to discuss today with you. So it's a, an action with, with a very concrete objectives, a very concrete outcome, uh, deliverables that have to be reached by the end of 2024. Basically, the action also just started uh, earlier this year. Um, last year, the uh, member states, uh, the process of defining the actions, uh, the content, the deliverables, and the member states were also asked to commit to these uh, actions. I'll come back to this. Now, there are four uh, objectives. One is to strengthen the recognition of the profession of research management. Um, Second one is upskilling, improve training and skills development opportunities of research managers. Third one is networking, making sure that early career research managers have access to uh, best practices, uh, training and so on. And the final one is capacity building, reinforcing research management capacity across the entire era, uh, especially in organizations and regions in Europe that are of lower research innovation intensity. Now, it's all about research management, um, and but research management is not defined so far. Um, it's therefore considered to be very broad, uh, multidimensional, in, including pre and post award services, including innovation support, knowledge valorization officers. It includes administration, policy um, officers, so very broad. The process within Action 17 is helping us to get to a definition. Uh, I'll come back to why this is important in one of my next slides. Uh, so for the moment, we, we include uh, knowledge transfer, knowledge valorization activities, uh, or at least the support for the entire research innovation enterprise as part of research management until um, the stakeholders and the member states uh, define what exactly the research management uh, entails. Uh, to give you an idea, in, in Germany a few years ago, uh, a definition has been, uh, they have tried to establish a definition, but they failed after several years of discussion and, and uh, ended up with a code of conduct for research management. And still, it, it keeps on to be very broad. Uh, but in any case, we are pursuing with Action 17 um these four objectives recognition upskilling networking and capacity building what is the state of play uh, 16 member states committed to air action 17 meaning that they will, will implement the activities at national level activities and that they will support uh, the european development of this action it's one associated country as well to do stakeholder organization. And in addition to the 16 committed member states, there are also five who are following every activity that did not commit. Uh, but in any case, good news that they are following. Um, there are three very active sponsors, so-called sponsors, uh, to the activity. They are not um, paying anything, but they are delivering from their own practice uh, and pushing the action forward. These are Germany, Hungary, and the university sector. In this case, represented by Aurora Universities Network. Um, we have two projects ongoing, RM Roadmap and Cardea. And RM Roadmap, you are familiar to because you're a partner in there. Um, both projects are essential for the implementation of the Action 17. RM Roadmap focuses a lot on um, well, defining what research management uh, entails, but also uh, setting up an ambassador's network in every country in Europe to uh, map um, needs, to uh, create national communities and for training and practice exchange and so on. And Cardea uh, is creating a careers and competence framework focuses a bit more on HR practices uh, than RM Roadmap is. Uh, that's one um, part of 
one strand of the policy development activities uh, through this project. The second is uh, that we are organizing workshops with member states, delegates and stakeholder organizations, including independent experts in research management. And so far we had three workshops and a lot of uh, practical information and recommendations are, are coming out of this. Uh, we have made progress on upskilling and recognition uh, in this sense, and we initiated the networking and capacity building objectives. So for the next year, we will finalize these activities. In addition, uh, in other actions of the policy agenda, it was found out that uh, several uh, well, that research managers are crucial for implementation of, of several other actions. For instance, the reform of research assessment. Of course, the knowledge valorization, where we already discussed a lot on intermediaries, where, where you are uh, strong. In. Um, the group of member states, delegates and stakeholders mapped the most important challenges on recognition and upskilling and also on, on the other objectives, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, there is a high diversity of roles, but there is a lack of definition of the profession. And, and why is that important? In many countries, there are no job profiles. Uh, in many organizations, uh, there are single persons doing a lot of roles, uh, but without any reward, without any career prospects. Uh, there is a, a lack of understanding overall of the impact and the added value of research management for impactful research. Uh, and many features like uh, law, uh, legal uh, quality standards of a profession are missing. Research management is not defined in the, any HR classification so far. Challenges on upskilling exist as well. There is no competence framework for research management or at least in most countries, it is absent. Now, this is being under construction at the European level, as I said. There are a variety of training tools and courses available, but there is no quality control. There is no sustainability of these uh, online tools. And many training courses are inaccessible to uh, those who are left alone in the office, basically, especially. It's unequally distributed, this, this access to training, which is also uh, often a financial uh, problem. And while the research enterprise and innovation enterprise is getting more and more complex, more um, needs in terms of compliance are coming up, uh, there is more need for training uh, to, to not only early career is a research manager, but, but any uh, research manager. So the group of member states, delegates, commission and stakeholders came up with some um, recommendations for better research management recognition and upskilling. So recommendations, I'm sorry for the busy slide, but I, I, I got you through it. At, at European level, uh, the commission is called to improve uh, awareness about the added value of research management for the European RNI system to develop a generic career and competence framework for research management. So I already mentioned this is, is being done by, by the project. Expand the use of uh, job platforms like your access and uh, the HRS4R, the HR Excellence Award uh, to the research management community to establish support to policy implementation for member states by exchange of practices. So this is a European level recommendations from the group of experts. Um, and there are also uh, recommendations directed or targeted to the member states uh, to adopt and adopt the competence framework for research managers to facilitate networking. This can be very easy in logistically, uh, making sure that the community at national level can meet, encourage organizations uh, and especially the leadership of, of organizations to engage in peer learning on the added value of research managers, invest in the upgrading of the RNI system by uh, establishing targeted support. There are also recommendations addressed to both the member states and commission together uh, to create mentoring schemes, mobility schemes for research managers, just as there are for researchers. Explore also a targeted budget for capacity building in research funding instruments. Uh, so these are recommendations from the experts from 
the uh, 21 member states, associated countries and, and stakeholder groups uh, that, that are participating in this uh, action. Um, next steps for action 17 on the short term is to follow up on the implementation of these recommendations um, and developing a second set of recommendations for capacity building. And the first steps in that direction are taken earlier this month uh, in another workshop. Um, another next step is to establish a team of experts to collect data on the added value. Now, the project uh, RM Roadmap especially is collecting success stories um, for a narrative on the added value of research management, but what is lacking are uh, quantitative data. Uh, so, and therefore the commission uh, will be following up uh, with the study. The idea is also for the general era monitoring process to have a monitoring methodology ready to assess the impact, uh, but also make the progress member states and the European Union in general can make at the level of capacity um, for research management. So uh, there is uh, one other next step, but this is more for uh, after we have all this information, the data is an action plan for awareness raising uh, to leadership of organizations. And as well, we have to prepare already a next phase for the research management initiative under the ERA policy agenda 25-27, which the ERA forum, the governance structure of the ERA is currently uh, developing. I'll briefly introduce you to that and then you can shoot questions and, and recommendations. Now, first on this study, uh, I mentioned there are no quantitative data readily available. Um, and there are a lot of questions. So the commission is asked to conduct a study, but we are checking feasibility. We are checking um, which data we can use. Um, so researcher is, uh, um, a profession that is um, available in national data, data statistical offices. Uh, research management is usually integrated in a lots of other data. So we need to extract uh, some of this. Uh, so there are a lot of questions how, how to do it. And in that sense, I'm uh, well, I'm also here uh, out of curiosity. Uh, ASTP is an organization that is in many of the aspects in terms of recognition, upskilling and, and um, uh, networking, very well established. And probably you can help us out here uh, where to find the right data, uh, where to find the right concepts, uh, how to, to measure this uh, probably. Um, so that's, that's uh, the preparations of a study that we will conduct uh, next year uh, have started uh, last week, in fact. Um, now, in as I uh, briefly laid out, is that the ERA Forum, the governance structure of the European Research Area, is uh, developing the next policy agenda for 25-27. And the group of uh, experts from member states and stakeholders in Action 17 was asked to prepare a next uh, action, a, a follow-up of, of the current one. And then the member states will uh, decide on if this action gets the green light uh, next year. So that in 2025, uh, potentially a new uh, or follow-up action can start. So it, it really starts from the current work um, where we consider that the, the four objectives will be implemented, will be reached, uh, but it builds on there. So we will, we should have evidence, both qualitative and quantitative evidence so that we can do an evidence-based awareness raising campaign. So that's a proposal from, from uh, the experts. Implementation, uh, we should also have obviously have a, have a clear idea on, on what we mean with research management, what the boundaries are. Second is the, uh, we, uh, the idea is to launch and implement uh, this career and competence framework, which is to, will be developed at European level to implement it, adapt it to the needs of, of, uh, of member states and implement it at, at the level of member states. 
uh, we will have an, uh, a platform for which we will take the first steps next year to have uh, accessible, uh, widely accessible uh, curricula as well as upskilling activities, training tools and so on available to the research manager community in the union. Um, there will be a European-wide learning and skills development program with peer-to-peer -peer learning and mobility components at the end of 20, uh, the next period. And the first links with industrial research management uh, will be set up at the end of this period. Uh, so that's it. Um, so this activity is now being discussed. The results of the current policy agenda activities will be uh, judged and then uh, it will be decided if, if this activity will continue be integrated somewhere else if uh, somewhere else if there are synergies needed uh, and so on um to end i would like to uh, show you highlight that there are two funding opportunities for to strengthen research management capacity uh, next year in the horizon europe widening participation and strengthening the era part of the program which is the horizontal part one is era talents so we offer, uh, this is focusing on intersectoral training and mobility, but it has two uh, main categories. The first one is um, career and training and career development for um, to comply with the needs of industry, skills demand. And the second is uh, for other research innovation talents next to researchers, entrepreneurs and so on. We target research managers basically. Then there is an action uh, which will be a coordination support action supporting policy, just like uh, Cardia and Oram Roadmap are doing, a third project that will help in a professionalization of research management and, and the awareness raising uh, campaign that was asked uh, that, uh, to the Commission. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening and for your interest in, in this initiative. And I'm um, hoping to continue the uh, very good collaboration with ASTP in RM Roadmap, but also in, in the Action 17 group uh, of member states experts in, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stein. Um, ah, yeah, and Anna has joined, so please, Anna, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Steen, thank you very much, Christoph, for uh, the beginning because I just got uh, some technical problems, but I'm now back in. So I managed to follow, uh, I think, uh, the, the main part of Steen, uh, Steen's presentation. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, the audience to write down their questions. Uh, but uh, maybe before... Uh, you type it because I can't see any coming in for the time being. Uh, I know, Steen, that you are active also in uh, the exercise concerning knowledge valorization and you mentioned some synergies. So maybe if you could please comment from uh, your perspective on the expectations from the side of European Commission how uh, to merge the two topics better in order to have a real impact on the whole European innovation ecosystem. If there is more to say on the top of your presentation. Sure. Um, last week, uh, the ERA forum of last Thursday, um, every action in the current policy agenda that needs continuation was presented to the era forum so including action 17 including also action 7 which is about, about knowledge valorization um, there is no judgment made yet by the era forum on which action should continue uh, this is for the coming months and they will indeed decide on which action should be lifted to a higher level uh, with a standing group uh, like for instance there is the ASFRI uh, on the research infrastructure group, which actions deserve continuation, which actions need to be integrated in each other, merged, or which should have a separate life. 
Um, now, on, on the op option of uh, merging knowledge valorization and uh, research management was proposed. Um, the conclusion so far, but as again, the, the judgment will be for, for later, for February, uh, most likely, is that because the Action 17 is in its infancy, it, it probably needs to continue like a, a separate action for the moment. Um, it is just developing policy, while in knowledge valorization, a lot of policy has been developed, like the code of practice uh, for knowledge valorization and so on. That doesn't mean that there should, uh, shouldn't be uh, more stronger synergies developed, um, because the needs in knowledge valorization for intermediaries are quite similar. Although an intermediary might, there it might be a bit um, further uh, along the pipeline uh, of development than, than the, the, the other <clears throat> parts of research management. What also needs to be discussed next week by the experts of the member states and the stakeholders, if what, what research management now means, does it indeed include knowledge valorization activities or not? Do we keep these separate or should should we keep them together? And so that discussion will also define if if uh, there are separate activities needed or or uh, uh, that we need to merge. So it, it's all under development, basically the short answer. Okay, thank you. I still can't see. Yeah, we've got the one question from Anastasia, uh, can we have a little more detail on the professionalization of research management, coordination and support action you mentioned? So maybe yes. it's a continuation of your, what you opened in uh, the last comment. Yes, indeed. Um, so this is an activity, uh, a call in, in the work program. Uh, you should already be able to find it. A call opens, if I remember well, on the 6th of December and closes in uh, 12th of March, no, 12th of April, something like that. Um, it is, there is budget for one project and the idea is to, um, well, help professionalization of research management. Uh, it The activity should complement the existing project, uh, RM Roadmap and Cardea. Uh, just like this project, they will, be involved heavily in the policy development uh, for a bi-directional exchange uh, between the policy activities and the activities in the project. Um, we hope that the project will focus a lot, or we, we ask the project to focus on the awareness raising uh, activities, especially to leadership of organizations. Um, and yeah, so I invite you to have a look at the work program. It is already in the 23 work program, the call I mean, so you should be able to, to see the, all the details. Um, there will also be a frequently asked questionnaire uh, be published early December, so to make it uh, even more clear. So thank you very much. We've got one more question coming from the audience. Is there already any description of RM role in other parts of the world, uh, like outside of the EU, which you could leverage? Yes, there is. Um, I know that um, in RM Roadmap, uh, the coordinating organization is IARMA. They are collaborating a lot with NCURA, the US organization, where they have indeed a competence framework and a career framework, a very complex uh, one in UK as well. And this is, of course, part of the exercise, how this could be leveraged uh, to the European Union. In some countries in Europe, there are job profiles uh, for many of the roles in the research management, but in most other, there is nothing. It's a desert. And we hope by raising awareness about what is existing, uh, we can build a European framework. And that's uh, the job that Cardea and in collaboration with RM Roadmap is doing indeed. Sounds like a nice vision. So hopefully we will get there one day. Uh, maybe for the audience from uh, 
surroundings of ASTP. It might be also uh, interesting to comment on uh, the place for real innovation management and uh, not, not just uh, knowledge valorization, but uh, basically uh, intellectual assets management and, and uh, how to treat these. This will be my question. But in the meantime, we also have a question from Robert. Uh, very interested in the engagement of industry in future work. You mentioned that uh, it would be the secondary uh, framework uh, to look at the industry research managers. Uh, so if you consider a uh, movement of research managers between actually the academic uh, research uh, institutions and industry, Yes, thank you very much for this question, Robert. Um, two replies. Um, first of all, um, the the council in its recommendations on uh, no, sorry, in its conclusions at the end of 2021 uh, asked for an action to strengthen strategic capacity of public research organizations. So that's why we have this focus now. And um, within the group of experts of member states, we have considered opening up to non-academic sector or and 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 non-public organizations, uh, basically industry, businesses, uh, public administration, um, wherever research managers uh, work. Uh, but it was considered too soon. Um, there is practice exchange, um, but the because Action 17 is still in its infancy, uh, it is considered we first have to develop something for the public organizations. And then uh, at the end of, well, by 26, 27, we move on uh, to, to lay the necessary links with, with industry uh, research management. The second uh, reply to a question, we already try to improve this mobility. I briefly mentioned the ERA Talents um, action in the work program. It's a call open that opens in uh, April and closes in October. Um, and this is about this type of mobility, or part of it is it, the other part is a researcher mobility. But we it, it's really open between uh, companies and and public organizations to to be to have mobile research managers, research innovation ma managers of any kind. It's not defined. It's very wide open. So it is. We have a program that that uh, that's designed for for uh, that era talents. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So another question coming from the audience. Is there an expectation for the overlap between RMS and vis uh, envisioned by the Commission and RTTP roles within industry? Um, I'm sorry, you have to help me a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, recognized, uh, RTTP stands for Recognized Technology Transfer Professional. Oh, right which is uh, basically a certificate provided by international network to people who acquire some professional criteria. This is uh, judged by a group of independent experts and recognized within the knowledge and technology transfer professional community as yeah. kind of proof of your qualifications. I think we should stay away from any overlap. Uh, to be very clear, but there is a, a huge gap uh, beyond the uh, tech transfer uh, community. Um, so one outcome of the careers and competence framework and uh, could be the development or uh, of curricula and certification of, of, of trainings uh, through micro credentials or full master programs, basically. And we see that there is some movement uh, in Portugal, in Germany, uh, to try to set up such uh, training and curricula uh, tools. They, for the moment, stay away from the tech transfer uh, community, and and um, and yeah. So, but it, it will. There will be some some material like that. 
in in Ankura in the US, there are also certifications uh, available for for research managers beyond uh, knowledge valorization. So this is can be copied. But what what I should mention is that the member states in in the in the group uh, have said repeatedly that they do not want a um, or not all of them want a mandatory certification. It should remain vol voluntary. It can be used when it is of added value, uh, but we shouldn't push the leadership of organizations uh, to. Uh, let them, their research managers, uh, obtain this certificate in, in a, such a certificate in an uh, obligatory way. So it, it would be useful to have a lot of training tools available where people can uh, use them themselves if they see it uh, useful to, to make, uh, to progress in their career, but not as a, a mandatory tool. And we should avoid anything uh, that is. Uh, overlapping uh, of course as well i think we can learn a lot from the way you dealt with it uh, so far for the other parts of research management okay thank you so i think it uh, leads nicely back to my question uh how much uh, do you work within the like rm framework uh, with uh, intellectual assets management, which is now a crucial topic for knowledge valorization. And naturally, it's embedded in any research planning activity since the very beginning, uh, because uh, any outcomes from a research project can hopefully be treated as some intellectual assets in some nearer or later future. Uh, so if this element is somehow covered by your plans and uh, regardless whether it's academic research or industry research or any other type of research which you can think about because this is quite a universal concept. Um, we did not go in that much detail, uh, Anna. So um, I think this will be more clear in the course of next year by summer or so when we will have a definition of what we mean with research management and after that the training tools uh the career framework competence framework can be developed uh or or accelerate basically so for the moment the intellectual asset management has not been discussed and i must say i learned a lot from you during the knowledge valorization on that uh, aspect uh, the previous year so but this is something that we will take into account next year yeah because uh, i think there is uh, still a lot of space and need for discussion uh, you mentioned that you would like to avoid uh, overlaps uh, i would rather say that we need synergies in between research management topic and like innovation topic and intellectual assets management and knowledge and technology transfer or knowledge valorization. So it's all very uh, interlinked and uh, we still need to, to clarify what belongs to where exactly to avoid any duplicities and uh, potential conflicts and confusion by the community because I think this is the most important that people know uh, what to do, where to do it. I don't know if we've got any more upcoming questions uh, from the audience. Can't see anything on the screen. Uh, and uh, with regard to the specific kind of skills and everything, I hope we will hear more details from Dario, who's coming next. Uh, talking about uh, basically research competence framework. Uh, so I believe uh, there is uh, also close link between research competence framework and uh, definition of research manager. Uh, so I don't know, Stin, if you want to kind of comment on this bridge between what you do and what uh, Dario will be talking about. Well, actually, we are in the same unit, uh, Dario and me. So um, I can tell you that 
on the 8th of December, uh, the Council will adopt uh, Council recommendations on a European framework for research careers. Uh, this has just been concluded uh, in the Council. Um, this framework is um, laying out, but Dario will explain, eh? uh, is laying out a profession of researcher, but also makes a lot of hooks for research management in, in all its dimensions that, that we know now. Um, so, of course, there are a lot of links between the research and the price and research management both are uh, interlinked and um, there is no dichotomy often between those who do research and those who support the research the, it is one two parts of, of a big process and since research doing research is getting more and more complex uh, a lot of compliance there are there is more need for research management type of activities to bring very good results closer to commercialization or public use. Uh, and all of this is, is uh, mentioned in this framework for, for research careers. Um, so there are clear links. The, the, what we also concluded in a previous discussion within the group of Action 17 is that the research competence framework that uh, Daria will pre uh, present, researcher competences, um, that the same competences that, that are needed transversal skills that are needed to do research are in, in another um, emphasis also needed for research management. So, of course, uh, the competence framework that, that Dari will present is also useful uh, for, for uh, research managers. And what Cardea is doing, it, uh, the project it, uh, to develop a career and competence framework, it's building on that of the researchers. So I would say stay tuned for, for this uh, um, European framework for research careers because uh, there is an annex to this is the new charter for researchers um, that this a new version, updated version of the charter and code, which many of you uh, may know, and that exists since 2005. So this uh, will now be updated, uh, explaining good working conditions, career paths, uh, diverse careers, uh, including research management. Uh, so this is uh, promising. OK, thank you. So maybe to ah, yeah, uh, to conclude, uh, which uh, skill or up to three skills do you consider the crucial ones for a good research manager? Um, good management, good communication skills, and diplomatic skills. Because often research managers mediate between researchers and the leadership of researchers and national funders or uh, European funders. So these three, I would say. Great. Thank you very much. I'm glad you said diplomacy because it's needed as well. And thank you very much, Steen, and thank you for having shared with us the, the news and the upcoming calls, which might be interesting to some of our colleagues listening today. So thanks very much for your time and effort, and see you soon. And uh, we are slightly ahead of the schedule, if I'm not mistaken, but if Darius ready, I would like to thank to Steen and invite Dario to tell us some more on uh, research competence framework. Uh, we had, uh, I think, quite nice introduction from your colleague. Uh, I understand you work both in the same unit uh, in uh, European Commission uh, DG Research and Innovation, uh, focusing on uh, excellence and uh, research careers. To, to be very brief, but if you would like to add anything on the context and uh, your work, please feel free to do so, and the floor is yours. 
Yes, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad uh, that I met so that uh, we can uh, we can continue even if we are a little bit ahead of schedule. And uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, indeed, I work together with Stain, same unit, uh, working on research careers. And I will be happy today to uh, present the work that we have done on uh, Research Comp, which is the European Competence Framework for Researchers. And uh, if you bear with me for a moment, I will share my uh, presentation. Uh, so that should be... Um, so, the, the, I don't know why I, this one is appearing. Uh, sorry, just one more moment. Okay, I hope that you can see it now. Yes, it seems okay. Thank and it is, it, is it full screen? Uh, yes, it's full okay. screen. If we Perfect. just try to move slides, maybe jump that it works as well. Uh, we yes. This, this is fine. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so uh, I will uh, I will be happy then to present uh, uh, Research Comp, which, as I said, is the European Competence Framework for Researchers, and. Uh, I will uh, articulate the presentation along the questions that you see on screen. So why uh, we developed it, uh, what is it, how it was developed, what is its structure and the use that can be made of it. And then I will also mention uh, its website and the support on which we are working for the uptake uh, of this tool. Um, so let's start with why we developed it. And uh, I, you can see here a bit of background. Uh, we uh, know that uh, researchers are very often confronted with precarious working conditions. They uh, work on the basis of uh, consecutive project-based temporary contracts. Um, and we also know that the skills that are provided to doctoral candidates very often are focused on careers uh, in academia, uh, only in academia. Uh, it also happens very often that researchers are actually unaware about the transversal skills that they have developed. Um, and well, connected to all of this, and uh, uh, in particular, I will say to the precarious working conditions, uh, it is um, to be underlined that researchers are, that it is important that researchers are able to size opportunities in the broader labor market, but also that they are able to create their own businesses. Uh, and this is also uh, very important considering uh, that uh, the uh, labor market uh, is uh, in need for highly skilled talents. Uh, and from this point of view, researchers obviously can be <clears throat> the answer. Um, so wha what, uh, uh, what were the, 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 the policy documents that guided the development of the European Competence Framework for Researchers. Uh, back in 2020, the Commission adopted uh, two communications. One was the skills agenda, and the other one was the communication on the new European research area. And both these policy documents made a reference to uh, the transversal skills, well, to the skills of researchers and to the need to develop a European competence framework for researchers. There was a dedicated action, action five in the skills agenda, and in parallel, there was also an action, action eight in the uh, era communication. So based on that, we started our work. But then it is also important to underline, and I imagine that uh, my colleague Stein already referred to it, uh, it is important to underline that the Council adopted uh, in November 2021 the Pact uh, for Research and Innovation containing the um, uh, principles and values for research and innovation in Europe and also 
uh, areas um, for joint uh, intervention, joint priority areas for intervention to reinforce research and innovation in Europe. Uh, they also adopted some council conclusions with 20 actions to implement the Pact for Research and Innovation. And one of the actions, namely Action 4, focuses on strengthening research careers. Um, what uh, did we do and what are we still doing in the context of this Action 4 on research careers? Uh, well, we started developing a um, very comprehensive document, uh, which uh, is actually the European framework for research careers, for attractive re research careers. Uh, I'm sorry if the wording uh, can be slightly confusing, uh, but we have on the one hand this European framework for attractive research careers, on the other hand the, the topic of my uh, presentation today, which is the European competence framework for researchers. Um, but here I'm talking about the overall, uh, the overall policy context, therefore I'm referring to the uh, European Framework for Attractive Research Careers, which is uh, uh, actually a proposal for a Council recommendation that the uh, Commission adopted in July and which is a document to which I also heard that Stein referred to. Uh, this is a document addressing all challenges for research careers in Europe in order to make them more attractive and the focus is on all sectors, so um, academia as well as businesses, uh, businesses industry, public administration, uh, NGOs, I mean any sector where researchers can work. Uh, so the package uh, that we are developing in the context of Action 4 is based on these standards set by this document. But then we also have a number of tools to support the implementation of these standards. And ResearchComp, so the European Competence Framework for Researchers, is in fact one of those tools. Together with other tools such as uh, our Research and Innovation Careers Observatory that the Commission uh, is in the count in the is currently developed. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, sometimes it's uh, interrupted, but it's still okay. Okay, okay, because I just got uh, like a small message on my screen and I wanted to make sure that everything was uh, was fine. Thank you for confirming. So I was saying that uh, in the context of these tools, so we have Research Comp, we have uh, our Research and Innovation Careers Observatory, which is currently being developed uh, in partnership with the OECD. Uh, and then we have other tools, uh, you know, your access, uh, uh, certainly there is the ERA Talent Platform, which is also being developed and which will be a one-stop shop for researchers. We are also doing some mutual learning exercises, uh, which uh, consist in uh, um, basically the possibility for member states to exchange uh, good practices and lessons learned uh, on, on several topics. We have uh, one currently ongoing on uh, intersectoral mobility as well as knowledge valorization and there will be another one coming next year which will actually be uh, to support uh, the implementation of the council recommendation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, another important strand of this overall package for research careers is cultural change. What do we mean by cultural change? We mean that there is a need to reform research and researchers assessment and this is something uh, that uh, is currently being done as you might be aware uh, in the context of the of the COARA uh, which is the coalition uh, for advancing research as assessment uh, and which is linked to another action of the era policy agenda action 3 um, and then finally we are also working on investments to support the implementation of the council recommendation and we will start with a pilot uh, in uh, 2024 a pilot under horizon europe 
which will uh, target uh, intersectoral consortia, so uh, academia, but also uh, pri private sector, I mean, all relevant actors to um, form intersectoral consortia uh, in order to foster the implementation of the standards set by the Council recommendation, by the new charter for researchers, with the overall objective of uh, improving working conditions uh, for uh, researchers, for talents, and therefore to create uh, a talent ecosystem uh, which really puts the people at the center of it. And uh, this is to, to, to summarize what we did on the 13th of July. Uh, we launched as commission the proposal for the council recommendation that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, this proposal for a council recommendation also comes with uh, uh, the new charter for researchers, uh, which uh, will replace uh, the, chart, the existing charter and code for researchers. Um, and then uh, on the same day, we also officially launched the website of ResearchComp. And uh, uh, we can now move after this uh, policy context. Uh, we can move to the uh, to what uh, a competence framework is, um, in order for you to better understand uh, what the, the the context of research comp. So a competence framework is a framework which relates to important fields, uh, which is based on reliable data and on consensus. Uh, it identifies and describes competences in a given field, and it creates, in fact, a common language and understanding. In our case, for EU competence frameworks, obviously, this uh, is valid at EU level. And, of course, it fosters the development of the competences uh, that are contained in a given competence framework. There are already uh, other, there were already uh, other EU competence frameworks before the development of Research Comp. Uh, you can see some examples on the screen, like DigiComp for digital competences, EntreComp for entrepreneurial competences, and so on. And uh, all of these competence frameworks have been developed either directly by the uh, Joint Research Center of the Commission or uh, with their coaching. Uh, in the case of Research Comp, uh, the development was with the, the coaching of the uh, JRC. Uh, but let's see now how we developed it. And uh, I will start uh, with a slide which summarizes all the steps that we took. But before going into more details, it is important to highlight that uh, we have actually done two uh, different uh, strands of work at the same time, but we, which in fact are based on the same uh, source uh, of, of work. What do I mean? I mean that uh, we uh, first updated with the transversal skills that are needed by researchers, we updated the ESCO classification, which is a technical classification uh, managed by the Commission, by DG Employment, and which contains uh, all uh, um, occupations, uh, not only for researchers, this is a very general classification. So, it uh, uh, as we will, I, I will show you later a slide, but just to, to make a sh short introduction, it is a sort of dictionary of occupations uh, in all sectors and of skills that are needed for a given uh, occupation. So, what the work that we did was first in order to update the ESCO classification uh, in order to um, include for all occupations that are uh, possible for researchers um, to put a list of transversal skills that can be linked to that uh, or to, 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 the, to those given occupations. So that was the first thing that we did. And then on the basis uh, of uh, those transversal skills that we used for the ESCO update, we con continued the work in order to develop research comp. Um, so 
to define the list of transversal skills, we started with literature review with the help of some experts, and then we continued in the context of a study. And uh, uh, there were also some surveys that were done uh, among researchers and also among umbrella organizations. Uh, some case studies were identified, and there was also the analysis of the uh, full 2020 URA access database to, ski, to see what skills and competences were requested by employers from the different sectors. Uh, and all of this was to identify this list of transversal skills relevant for researchers. Once we identified this list of skills, this was used to update the ESCO classification, uh, which happened at the beginning of 2022. And then we carried on we carried on the work uh, with interviews with stakeholders, uh, a focus group, uh, a validation meeting, and all of this helped us develop the uh, conceptual model of research comp. And this was actually uh, described in a policy brief, uh, which was published and uh, which you uh, can see mentioned on, uh, on screen in this slide. So this was uh, the, the initial part of the development of Research Comp. Uh, it included uh, everything, I would say, uh, except the learning outcomes that are needed to develop a certain competence. But before going ahead, uh, this is the slide that I was mentioning on ESCO, because I know that uh, it, it is not easy to understand if you are not familiar with it. So uh, just for you to better understand, ESCO is this European classification of skills, competences and occupations. It works as a dictionary, uh, as I said before. Uh, describing, identifying, and classifying uh, all professional occupations. And then for each occupation, the list, the list, there is a list of skills that are either uh, needed or can be needed. So there are some uh, necessary skills and some optional skills uh, for a given uh, occupation. Um, and uh, as you can see here, uh, and as I said before, the new version of ESCO was launched in January 2022. It contains over 3,000 occupations and over 14,000 skills. And it was important to start with this step of the update of the ESCO classification before developing Research Comp, because the two activities are really complementary. Uh, they both help uh, um, understanding what transversal skills are needed by researchers. Uh, in addition, uh, the ESCO classification is also transposed at national level uh, through EURES, so the uh, European Network of Public Employment uh, Services. So all national uh, vacancies are then adapted based on the skills uh, on the skills contained in ESCO, um, and and of course this this uh, job that we did was also helpful uh, to uh, foster a better recognition of the research professions and to uh, for researchers to better understand the skills and competences uh, that they need. But let's now focus on what I'm sure will be the most interesting part uh, of the presentation for you, which is uh, the structure and the use of research comp. And uh, uh, in fact, you can see on this slide uh, the visual uh, of research comp, um, which is the one that uh, you, you will also find, in fact, on uh, the website. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, also an important activity that we developed in the context of the European Year of Skills. Um, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's focus now on structure and content. As you can see, uh, we have seven competence areas, which are uh, uh, doing research, managing research, making an impact, and so on. Uh, and then we have a total of 38 competences that uh, transversal competences that are relevant for uh, researchers. Um, now, um, a few important messages uh, that you need to be aware. 
all competences are equally important and interrelated and they can be acquired uh, via it can be formal training or informal uh, training um, and then very important it, it is also to say that uh, each stakeholder will make uh, the use of research comp that it is uh, um, more useful uh, for for their own needs so uh, this is really a, a guiding tool but then each stakeholder can make the use of it which is um, really uh, the most useful one uh, and then we don't expect all every single researcher to develop uh, all competences of research comp um, we rather think encourage uh, i should say uh, we, sh we we encourage a research team, uh, if possible, to cover all the skills uh, of research comp uh, in order in order to be to be successful. Um, as you can see, there are several uh, competences which are relevant for uh, well transfer of knowledge for technology transfer uh, in making an impact you can see uh, some of them there is uh, uh, in fact the competence on promote promoting the transfer of knowledge there is uh, uh, promoting open innovation uh, but then there are in fact other competences which are i think and you, you will certainly see them uh, are important uh, in in your field uh, some of them are in fact, uh, some cognitive abilities, but then, well, uh, I imagine that also competences such as uh, uh, developing networks, uh, working in teams, uh, uh, interacting professionally. I mean, all of these uh, are important as well as uh, uh, in, in the self-management category uh, show entrepreneurial spirit. So there are a number of competences which are relevant for uh, your field. Uh, but obviously, this is a general competence framework applicable for researchers in order for them to be able to work in all uh, possible sectors. Uh, what is the use that can be made of research comp? Uh, you can see here four categories. Well, the, researcher, the researchers themselves can uh, use research comp to self-assess their competences. I said at the beginning of my presentation that often researchers, uh, in fact, possess some of the competences of research comp, but they are not aware of them. So research comp can really help them identifying uh, the competences that they already master uh, and also what level they have. And they can uh, obviously, if needed, uh, develop, uh, decide to upskill. Higher education institutions and other training providers can develop courses uh, based on the competences and learning outcomes of research comp. And we, we also think that universities, and we encourage, in fact, universities to adapt their doctoral training to include, uh, the, uh, to include training on the transversal skills of research comp. Um, employers uh, also uh, can uh, benefit from research comp because they can see, they can have a clear view of what researchers can offer and they can also use research comp to develop their job vacancies. And then, of course, we also see a, a role for policymakers uh, to support the use of research comp and to um, de further develop or adapt policies. Um, I, I showed you the visual with the competences of research comp, but it is important to understand that there are four different proficiency levels uh, foreseen for each of the competences. So from foundational uh, up to intermediate, advanced and expert. So for each of the competences, there are these, uh, these four levels. And uh, you can see here the overall structure of research comp, starting with the seven competence areas, uh, the 38 competences, which come with the scriptors, 
Each competence, as I said a moment ago, has got a proficiency level, has got four proficiency levels. And then for each proficiency level, uh, there are a number of learning outcomes. And this will be more understandable by looking at this slide, where uh, you have uh, the example uh, of uh, a competence, which is the competence abstract thinking, which is part of the competence area cognitive abilities. You see the descriptor, uh, and then uh, there are the four proficiency levels, and for each level, there are a number of learning outcomes. These learning outcomes can be important for researchers to understand, to position themselves, um, I mean, to, to self-assess whether they have uh, this competence and at which level. And uh, um, higher education institutions, training providers can, of course, use these learning outcomes to develop training for uh, researchers. And then uh, let's focus on the website and on the support for the uptake of Research Comp. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the website of Research Comp was launched on the 13th of July. Uh, I encourage you, uh, if you have not done it yet, to go and visit the website uh, in order to have um, a, a deeper understanding of Research Comp you can, uh, if you wish, uh, have a look uh, at the uh, interactive document with all the uh, competences, descriptors, learning outcomes. And uh, um, I also wanted to talk about what activities we are doing to support the uptake of Research Comp. Uh, before I forget and before I focus on the, uh, on the slide, uh, you might also want to have a look at uh, uh, the uh, so-called ERA Talk. Uh, ERA Talk is a, a short video that we prepared on Research Comp um, with the explanation of what it is uh, and uh, with the participation of uh, uh, a researcher, uh, a, represent a representative from universities and a, re a representative from the business sector in order to understand how each uh, sector can benefit uh, from research comp. So if you wish, uh, you will find on the website of research comp the link to this ERA talk, which is a, a short video, 10 minutes uh, video. Uh, if you are more interested in, in research comp, you can, uh, I think this can be beneficial. But talking about um, support actions, uh, it is important to mention that in the work program uh, of Rights on Europe, uh, work program 2024, uh, in the part on widening, um, widening participation and strengthening the European research area, there is a, a uh, topic on uh, uh, research comp uh, and there will be a call uh, which uh, will open uh, at the uh, in early december and will call, close in early march 2024 uh, and uh, uh, this will be uh, really to, 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 to foster the use of uh, the competence framework for researchers uh, to exchange good practices on it uh, and to foster the development of the transversal skills that researchers need for intersectoral uh, careers, including on the basis of interaction uh, with uh, business and industry and other actors that need, uh, that need uh, or, or that can make use of the competences of researchers. In addition to this, in addition to this call, uh, we are also in the process of designing uh, some support action for the various actors, uh, um, such as, for example, uh, universities, associations of universities, associations of, uh, of researchers, uh, but also to, uh, we are also uh, seeing how to support at member states level the use of research comp. So this is still a uh, work in progress. Uh, if you have, of course, any ideas, we are, I'm happy to, to listen to you, but just to say that uh, the work will not stop 
uh, simply with the website, of course, but that we are uh, trying to work on a spectrum of activities that can support uh, the use of uh, uh, Research Comp. Uh, and I mentioned at the beginning of uh, my presentation of also some mutual learning exercises in order to um, in order for member states to exchange uh, good practices experiences uh, of course uh, in that context uh, uh, research comp will also uh, be part of the uh, discussion uh, i will stop uh, here uh, thank you very much for listening i hope uh, it was not uh, too difficult to understand and uh, i will be happy to answer any questions you may have thank you Dario, thank you very much for a very dense presentation, but uh, I think you have provided us with many uh, useful links where to go back to, to digest all, all the information provided. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my colleagues from the audience uh, are more than welcome to write down the questions uh, now. So if there is a question coming up, we should see it uh, shortly on the screen. But uh, in, in the meantime, uh, my question would be because I work at Charles University in the Czech Republic. Uh, at the Knowledge and Technology Transfer Office, and we are also responsible for entrepreneurship, innovation, education for both our students and staff. And of course, we know about Research Comp. Uh, my colleagues have been working with it uh, since summer, or I think even even before, because it's very helpful. Uh, kind of baseline, uh, what to use as an outline of our educational activities. Uh, we are talking about some micro degrees also linked to uh, the topic of entrepreneurship uh, in the widest sense of the word, uh, not just uh, how to set up a company, but also about being active and proactive and come up with new ideas. And we see very close links for Entrecomp as well. So my question would be, how do you actually work with the other uh, competence framework or maybe also others from your quite long list? And if you envisage any maybe joint support actions for both, uh, if there are any strong synergies for the future? Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, this is uh, an important question. I, I mentioned uh, in my presentation that there are several uh, competence frameworks and Antricomp is, of course, uh, one of them and a very important one. Now, what, uh, how are the different competence uh, frameworks uh, uh, somehow interrelated? Um, I have to say that, uh, uh, in fact, when we developed Research Comp, uh, but I think this is actually valid for uh, every every development of a research of a competence framework at EU level. Uh, what we did was to make sure that there was alignment between the the competences uh, contained in research comp and similar or same competences um, being addressed uh, by other competence frameworks. So you will not find. Uh, discrepancies between uh, similar competences in the various competence frameworks. Uh, this is valid for entry comp, but this is also valid for the other competence frameworks uh, developed at EU level by DJRC or with the support of DJRC. Now, when it comes to uh, more specifically the relationship between research comp and entry comp, uh, what happens there is that research comp is uh, a general competence framework for researchers. So you will find in it uh, all the transversal competences that a researcher may need for uh, intersectoral uh, successful careers. Uh, some of these competences are cer certainly highly relevant in the context of uh, entrepreneurship, but uh, obviously we believe that if 
a researcher has to go, um, I mean, decides to take a path which is really strictly uh, entrepreneurial, then Entrecomp uh, comes into, into question. So uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will see research comp as the general competence framework for researchers, but then uh, where needed, some other competence frameworks can help going more in depth. Uh, Entrecomp for entrepreneurial skills. There is also a competence framework on science for, for policy. Uh, developed by the Joint Research Center, and uh, that uh, obviously once again goes more into details uh, when it comes to competences related to um, uh, evidence for policy making um, and so on. So this is the relationship between uh, the two. Uh, from our side, we will continue to uh, develop support activities for research comp. Uh, I'm sure that uh, colleagues from the uh, Joint Research Center uh, are developing, uh, certainly developed already because EntreComp uh, dates back, I mean, I think it was developed some years ago. Uh, so I'm sure they already developed uh, activities and I'm sure there is already support material available, uh, but possibly they are also still developing new one. So I think uh, that uh, uh, also, uh, I mean, as we are developing support activities for Research Comp, there will certainly be uh, similar ones developed for Entry Comp. Thank you very much for uh, the explanation. Uh, I will repeat a call for audience if there are any questions related to research comp or um, any related uh, questions with regard to skills and competencies by researchers, what's expected, what's uh, may maybe in the meantime, before anyone dares to write down a question, uh, do you envisage any update or uh, kind of revision of uh, the framework or uh, do you expect it to stay as it is because provided the uh, fast advancement of uh, all technologies, AI and general speed of innovation in all fields, uh, it's great to have the framework, but uh, I think there should be some level of flexibility within it. So I don't know uh, for the learning outcomes, etc. Do, do you plan any uh, coming back to this and to revise it at some point or to make it future proof? Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, now concerning the questions, I never know whether uh, I was too clear or too confusing. Uh, but <laughs> I, I hope uh, in this case uh, it was rather the, the, the first, uh, the first thing. But um, jokes apart, uh, when it comes to updates, um, in fact, uh, Research Comp uh, in its um, final version has really been published uh, just a couple of months ago. So uh, for the moment, we, uh, we are not uh, uh, working on uh, updates, but of course, uh, I mean, as you said, uh, everything evolves uh, extremely fast. So we will, of course, uh, make sure that uh, whenever updates are necessary, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can work on them, uh, be them at the level of uh, competences, uh, but also at the level of uh, uh, learning outcomes. So uh, this is something which uh, we will keep an eye on. For the moment, we focused on the development, on the launch. We are working on uh, uh, support activities. Uh, but then when the time will uh, uh, require some adaptations, uh, some uh, further development, we will, of course, be ready to, to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, eventually uh, there was a question uh, written in the chat, but now we hopefully can see it on the screen. If there are any plans for specific actions towards European universities, initiative alliances, uh, uh, or if uh, there are separate and uh, we can see them within the framework of university associations or alliances. 
Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Anastasia, for this question. So when it comes to European uh, universities, uh, univer European universities alliances, um, what we did from the side of research and innovation was to complement uh, the support offered by Erasmus+, Plus. Uh, so some additional support for research and innovation activities uh, of these alliances. And uh, uh, this was based on uh, some modules, including one on, uh, on uh, uh, well, human resources, on, on researchers. So we, uh, we know that the alliances are working uh, to improve, uh, improve careers for researchers. We hope that in the context of the work that they, were, they are still undertaking, they will also make use of uh, uh, research comp. Having said this, um, when it comes for uh, when it comes to the future, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation uh, this overall package in support of research careers uh, that uh, we are working on, and I mentioned uh, the investment strand. So this pilot uh, that will be launched uh, at the beginning of. December and which will target intersexual consortia in order to improve uh, working conditions for researchers. Now, um, this, uh, th this pilot will target, obviously, as I said, intersexual consortia, so this will be valid also for alliances uh, if they wish, if they're interested to, uh, to, to uh, respond to the call. Um, uh, so this will be valid for alliances, but also uh, for any other uh, kind of uh, uh, academia associa associations uh, or networks of uh, universities. Um, and uh, the intersexual consortia will be requested to support the implementation of the standards set by the council recommendation that the commission adopted in july and which by the way will be now adopted in its final text by the council so by member states at the beginning of december um, but it, this intersexual consortia can also support make use to support the working conditions of researchers of, for example, research comp. So indeed, um, research comp will be important also in that context. Uh, and once again, uh, universities have an important role in the context of this consortium. So I hope that this answers uh, the question. And then I see, meanwhile, uh, what are the, another question, what are the dat databases available for research management in the market and what kind of skills to learn by research managers uh, to become an entrepreneur manager? Uh, okay, I think this is uh, a question which is possibly more linked to the presentation that was made by uh, my colleague Stein before. But what I can say on this is that uh, the competence framework that we uh, that I presented, so research comp, is uh, a competence framework for researchers. At the moment, uh, as I'm sure Stein explained, uh, there is an action of the ERA policy agenda, Action 17, which is uh, trying to pursue work uh, to further recognize and define the profession of research managers, uh, including in terms of skills. So the idea, I think, for the future will be once the, there is a clear understanding of a definition, uh, a clear understanding of a definition of research manager and clear understanding about the skills that are needed, then perhaps a competence framework will be developed for research managers but this is uh, I think still uh, still to, to be seen uh, but I imagine uh, that this could uh, could be the the way forward for the moment uh, we have research comp and certainly um, many of the competences that are contained by research comp are also relevant for research managers in any case as i explained in the presentation um, each uh, user 
can make use of research comp and can adapt research comp to their own needs so um yeah that that i think is what uh, uh what is my answer for that question yeah there is one more question coming up but i think it's slightly out of the topic so i'm not sure if you want to comment on this area but uh we can uh maybe yeah i think um, yeah this more is more general discussion as part of the uh like conference or workshop today uh Actually, I wanted to come back to the intersectoral consortia you mentioned, because I think this is very welcome activity uh, to support intersectoral mobility, which uh, can, I think, contribute a lot to widening the portfolio of skills and competencies of both the research community and the external partners. And so do you envisage this to be targeted uh, only at uh, like academia industry or uh, do you count with other type of potential members of consortia like public administration bodies or civil society organizations okay. yes uh, thank you anna in fact uh, our our idea is really to create uh, a sort of talent ecosystem so to have all uh, actors all relevant actors joining together to form these intersectoral consortia in order to improve uh, working conditions for researchers based on the council recommendation on the charter for researchers on the implementation of research comp and so on so the the idea is really to put to join forces together this will be a pilot that we uh, are launching to see how things can go and then uh, based on the results of the pilot we might envisage in the future uh, future action uh, to to uh, target uh, investments for um, for better working conditions at a more structural level but uh, in, indeed, to go back to your question, uh, we aim at intersectoral consortia that involve all relevant uh, actors in the field. Okay, this is good news. So thank, thank you for this. And uh, last call for any other questions related to research competence framework or general skills and competencies of researchers. If there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I would like to sum up with the same question I basically asked your colleagues team, what are the crucial skills and competencies for a research manager it was for him. So for researchers, uh, which would be the three main uh, skills, competencies uh, that you, you consider personally to be uh, like key for success in uh, any research career path. Uh, yes, thank you, Anna. Well, uh, uh, I, let's say that if I speak, if I mention and refer to research comp, we consider all competences equally important. Uh, if you ask me on a personal level, uh, then I, I will say that uh, a researcher today uh, needs uh, certainly to be good with uh, strictly uh, research related skills uh, so that that is that is one but then what is really important i think is the the, the uh, communication uh, skills uh, communication and also the capacity to reach policy makers i mean uh, i think we saw uh, with um, we saw with uh, the COVID situation, uh, but not only with COVID. I mean, this is something that unfortunately to, nowadays we see very often uh, that uh, science, unfortunately, uh, is very often put into question. Uh, so it is important that researchers are not really good at uh, uh, doing research, but also at communicating it in general to the public and also at reaching uh, policy makers so that uh, uh, policy decisions of policy makers are based on uh, uh, real 
scientific evidence uh, and not on uh, the uh, disinformation that we uh, very often see around. Okay, thank you very much. I agree very much with uh, the, the last comment because this is also the basis for any relevant innovation and basically moving forward or surviving uh, and being more resilient as the whole society community. So this was kind of nice visionary end to, to our discussion. Uh, so Dario, thank you again for uh, your presentation. I believe it will be shared with the audience so people can go back to all the links and uh, search for more information as well as to the website of Research Comp and the video we mentioned. Uh, so thank you for being with us today and giving us this interesting update. And uh, I think ASTP and the whole community will definitely try to stay in touch and provide more synergies towards knowledge technology transfer topics. And uh, our colleague Anwar is confirming that the presentations will be shared. So thank you very much. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, a break is coming up. So I think we all deserve a nice cup of tea or coffee. And uh, I will give uh, over to Anwar. So thank you very much, Dario. Thanks, everyone. OK, thank you, Dario. So we will take a short break and we'll be back at uh, 11.30 or 10.30, wherever you are now. So uh, the lounge will be open as well if you guys would like to go hang out, chatting at the table, that can be done too. As soon as we are back on session, you will know. Thank you. Okay, Hendrik, good to go. Hello, welcome everybody. And uh, we will have the pleasure of listening to Claudia Martinez Felix and Jonas Hein from DG Grove, uh, where they will tell us a bit about, if I understand things correctly, uh, standard essential patents or the new version of it, the patent package from the European Commission. Uh, I think everybody that's been in the patenting business for a while has learned to both love and hate standard essential patents because they're extremely strong sometimes and sometimes uh, they present some difficulties and challenges. But without more ado, please, Claudia and Jonas, please present yourselves. You're much better than uh, on that than me, so go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Henrik, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we will be presenting, well, let, let me start by myself. I'm Claudia Martinez Felix. I'm the deputy head of unit in DG Grow in the European Commission. It's uh, in unit C4. It's called Intangible uh, Economy. And um, I've been uh, working now in IP uh, and in the European Commission uh, for, for a good while um, as a step to head of unit. Also previously dealing with, um, with the free movement of goods. Uh, I've been dealing also you know, on other sides of the internal market policy from uh, services, also competition law. And so I've got a, a legal background and I've been in the commission now for more than 13 years. Previously, I had other experiences in other European institutions in the European Parliament and also in the uh, private sector. And I'm very pleased uh, to be here with Jonas, uh, is uh, my colleague that joined uh, not so long ago, but he is a a, a very good um, a patent, uh, also expert on uh, standard essential patents. But let me just not uh, clarify, Hendrik, what I will be presenting because patent package is three initiatives. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the the work we're doing, not only on standard essential patents that I will ask Jonas to cover, but also on the other fronts that I think are very important also for innovation and, and, and transfer of knowledge, uh, etc. Perfect. So Juna, Jonas, can you just briefly introduce yourself? Yes, briefly. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Yes, I'm Jonas. I work in Claudia's team on the SEPS uh, proposal. I, as she said, am um, just a recent addition to the team. Um, I came from the German Ministry of Justice as a seconded expert. 
um, and um, also have a legal background and was first um, uh, introduced to the SEPS saga back in 2012 when I studied it uh, um, uh, during my master's degree in the, uh, in the United States. So I'm um, happy to talk about that part of the, um, of the uh, patent package. Excellent. So a warm welcome once more. And without uh, more ado, I guess uh, I'll try to manage the questions. Maybe we open up for questions afterwards. Is that the way you prefer it, Claudia and Jonas? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So post your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that you'll get plenty of answering time afterwards. Please, Claudia. Sure. So let, let us start with presenting actually what we're doing on patents and in, in, in IP. Maybe if we go to the first slide here, um, this will give you, and you can quick, rather quick, because there is a number of um, elements that will be populating this, this slide. Um, this uh, is basically a slide which in, intends to introduce the policy context on the why and the what and the how. Uh, we're doing uh, the uh, revision of the existing legal framework for, for patents and why we are investing so much in this area because for the European Union, and you will all know very well, um, it has a long tradition of encouraging creativity and innovation precisely because of the importance that it has. It's, it's creating, if you look at what IPR intensive industries are generating, we're talking about more than 30% of all EU jobs in almost 47% of EU GDP. I mean, we're talking about 6.4 trillion uh, value generated by these IPR intensive industries. So it's clearly IP is a source of a tangible benefits for companies. And we have also seen it in recent studies that is actually uh, generating um, IP ownership, a greater economic performance. Uh, we have estimates that talk about 55% higher uh, employee revenues compared for other companies that do not have IP uh, protection. And um, even if uh, this is even more significantly important for SMEs, and what we see though is that the uptake by SMEs is still low. We're talking only about 9 to 10% of SMEs actually protecting their innovation. So that's also part of the work we're doing uh, by promoting, for example, uh, with the SME fund that you may be aware implemented by the EU IPO um, further support uh, for our SMEs when it comes to also uh, registration and other types of fees for uh, patents, national and European patents. But we, if if we move, um, you know, what what our mandate is and, and and why this, why now, right? We're coming with this patent package. I think it's very important also to flag that the IP system is, in our view, instrumental to achieve many of other. Uh, priorities that the union has and I cannot think of you know uh, one of the biggest ones that we have which is this new uh, zero act uh, instrument uh, which is basically putting in motion a transformation a green transformation that is uh, at the same time a great opportunity but also a challenge and where uh, certainly technologies uh, which we are seeing patented uh, can play a very important role. So we see uh, at this time in, 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 in the long-term priorities of the European Union that IP can therefore play that important role also because it will generate a bit of as a talisman for uh, investment uh, to to put in to those companies that are generating those uh, innovations that we need. We are also coming now or with the patent package, and I will explain these three initiatives in a minute, because we have come from a very severe uh, crisis and we have learned some lessons from the crisis uh, management. We, we, I'm thinking particularly with uh, with COVID-19 also, um, the IP dimension and the, and the, and the big uh, uh, well, discussions at international level that have been rolled out on the role that IP can can play. For example, uh, when we're talking about accessing uh, products, essential products like vaccines, etc. And also, 
because, as I was saying, uh, we are with the IT legal framework complementing other priorities and we're seeing as well with the pharma review that the European Union is putting forward uh, that uh, needs to be complemented by, from, from the IP dimension no? so that we ensure this balance between uh, modernizing, you know, investing into uh, uh, new drugs, for example, but at the same time ensuring that there is uh, sufficient uh, uh, capacity in cases of needs and emergencies. So if we uh, move uh, to the, well, yeah, to the next click. So here is this three patent pillars uh, of the patent package that we will be presenting in a minute. And um, we're talking about the supplementary protection certificates reform. We're talking about the compulsory licensing uh, commission proposal. And we're finally talking about the standard essential patents. Now, if we uh, move uh, forward uh, to that new slide, um, here what we see, of course, is that the patent policy and this patent uh, package that we are presenting is actually anchored around the unitary patent. You are certainly all uh, aware that the unitary patent has finally entered into force 1st June of uh, 2023 with 17 member states and it has established this one-stop shop for patent protection and enforcement in the union and this is certainly very important for uh, SMEs for reducing the cost for increasing legal uh, certainty for, for businesses but this is in a nutshell not enough because we see that we need to have our legal framework and I will talk in a minute also about the complexity of the legal patent framework that we see fit for purpose for um, for this new unitary patent because we, for example, and if we look here into this yellow box supplementary protection certificates, we have supplementary to protest, uh, uh, you know, protection certificates at national level, but we don't have SPCs that can build on this unitary pattern. Uh, if we look also at the green box compulsory licensing, what we have seen from the uh, emergency uh, crisis and I will, I will, I will go more into detail. But is that actually at union level we do not have a system that can actually tap in into technologies that are patented without, uh, you know, um, without a voluntary licensing being agreed. And so, therefore, we need to set up a new system that will give us uh, at union level this 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 tool in cases of of, of obviously last resort and, and emergency situations. And we we, we look at uh, the development of the of the new technologies and, and what we are aiming at doing with the, for example, uh, supplementary. Uh, sorry, the the standard essential patents, which is this light blue uh, box, is 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 bringing uh, transparency in a market which is you know, exponentially increasing in terms of uh, SEPs, uh, standard essential patents being considered uh, essential and also in light of the long trials and, 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 and litigations that we have seen uh, in Europe and also abroad. So those are, in a nutshell, the three pillars that uh, we will be now uh, presenting to you a bit more in detail. So if we go to the next slide, I, want, I, I was already mentioning that our European uh, patent policy is actually very complex. And, I'm, I, and, and, and here, I think this slide already visualizes what type of complexity we're talking about. We're talking about different layers, obviously, being uh, applicable. We're talking about this international level with, uh, obviously, international treaties such as TRIPS agreement, but Paris Convention, the Patent Cooperation Treaty. We're also having an intergovernmental level with the European Patent uh, Office, uh, the European Patent Convention, the uh, UPC agreement, which is part of the unitary patent scheme that has entered into force now in June uh, 2023. And what do we have at union level? At EU single market level, well, actually, we don't have that much harmonized union legislation. We have the biotech directive, right? We have the supplementary protection certificates regulations, which are, as I will explain in a minute, only available for, for uh, pharma and plant uh, protection products. And we have the unitary patent regulations, which still today are based on a specific you know, structure, which is the enhanced cooperation, does not actually incorporating all 27 member states with 
Spain and Croatia currently out of this uh, uh, unitary patent regulation system. And of course, patent law at national level and the one, you know, practice developed by the courts. So this is the patchwork of existing legal framework that we, with the patent package, are intending to introduce new elements that will uh, bring us a step closer to have what we call a union legal framework for patents, also a proper single market for technology. This is what we are aiming at. Now, if we move to the next slide, I will briefly introduce uh, the uh, supplementary protection certificates reform. I think this is also um, uh, relevant if we, if we go to the next uh, slide. Uh, to start with, and not certain, you know, the audience, what great you know knowledge you have on what are these SPCs as we call them you know in an abbreviate form so let me give you just uh you know a step back um and and and, and explain what a supplementary protection certificate is because as you know IP so patents are uh, provided for 20 years maximum duration as an exclusive right monopoly to use that technology. But what we have seen is in the context of medicines and plant protection products for many years already, that uh, there is a need to compensate for the loss of that effective patent protection due to the lengthy authorization procedure which is required uh, to, to, to basically use and place uh, those those products in the market. So what uh, the SPCs or what the Supplementary Protection Certificates intend to do is to compensate by giving this additional extension of the protection beyond the 20 years of the, of the patent, which can go up to five years uh, additionals. Five years and plus six months if we take into account the pediatric uh, extension, which is also forcing for this additional six, six months. Now, what is the existing legal framework today? As I said, we have union legislation, but actually the Supplementary Protection Certificate Scheme is governed and, and, and implemented at national level by the national IP offices and with a territorial um, uh, coverage which remains national. So we do have two EU regulations, one for medicinal products, which is this, uh, well, 469 slash 2009, and one for plant protection products or pesticides, uh, which is this one from 96. And there is also uh, a new you know, later uh, regulation, the 2019 slash 933, which is the SPC manufacturing waiver, which was amending the one of uh, medicinal products and which is also part of the legal framework that we are now reforming with our uh, patent package. Now, for um, just to give you, you know, uh, a clarification for pharma, SPC protection is available only for new patented active ingredients, so so-called products. So while medicines uh, based on new formulations, that is, for example, involving additional ingredients or new uses of known products are usually not entitled for SPC protection. Now, if we uh, move to the next slide, okay, so here you will have, and you can click, uh, yeah, voila, here you have a bit of a, you know, visual of what is actually the current problems that have been identified and what is that we are intending to uh, to propose as a reform in this in this area because um, you can see that we have this system at national level that currently there is no unitary SPC complementing or building on the unitary uh, uh, patent that, uh, as I was mentioning, is, is, is at the core of, of, of the reform we're now uh, doing with the SPCs. So what we are actually now proposing is to have, and I will go into that in a minute, is a centralized procedure for SPC applications to be actually handled at uh, union level. Uh, and at the same time, proposing, in addition to the national SPCs, the possibility to opt for a, na for a unitary SPC. Now, what will this bring? Well, you can see it's actually ensuring that we reduce the 
the cost of the whole procedure for that additional protection by 55%. So we're talking about reducing 100,000 euro uh, per procedure, which is, which is quite a lot if you take into consideration also that almost 20% of the SPC holders are actually, actually SMEs and also universities. And I know that today here we have many universities listening in. So I think this is important, uh, particularly also for universities, for SMEs, because it will reduce the cost. We will make the procedure more efficient. It's administrative burden that we want to reduce. Uh, we're not actually touching upon the criteria or the conditions under which the SPCs have to be granted. That remains, you know, the same, obviously, I mean, we intend to clarify a few elements uh, from the from the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice, but this is really a procedural uh, reform. Um, now, if we move on uh, uh, to the next slide, you may have seen also that currently if we compare the system at the Union versus the US, we're saying we're seeing that actually in the US is 60 percent, I know, six times uh, more, um, well, less less expensive than the union. So we really have to move forward on, on that front. And so what is that we are creating now? We are creating, as I was saying, a more efficient and, predictably, and predictable union SPC regime, complementing the unitary patent, but without removing the national procedures, nor modifying the substance of the SPC regime. And how do we do that? By, as I was mentioning, creating this centralized procedure, for the granting of the SPCs that will be hosted. So the examination will be done by the by 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 a panel by a number of panels that will be under the UIPO species and that will be sourcing from the national examiners' expertise. And in that EUIPO uh, uh, centralized procedure and um, authority, there will be uh, the possibility to either issue a binding opinion for national species that will be then uh, granted directly by the national uh, uh, um, IP offices, or if it is in, you know, a request to have a unitary SPC, it will be uh, granted directly by the EU IPO. So no need for validation or for granting from the national IP, IP offices because it will be done at centralized level and it will be a unitary title that will be uh, granted by the uh, EU IPO on the basis of the centralized examination that will be sourcing, as I said, the national expertise, the SPC's expertise from the national IP offices. What are the benefits? I already mentioned we will be avoiding fragmentation because what, what, what is happening today, you see results from different national IP offices for the same type of request that might sometimes contradict each other because it's taken at different you know, EU member states level. So with that procedure, we are introducing legal certainty, we are avoiding fragmentation, we are reducing cost, and we are increasing transparency. And this is very important both for the SPC holders, but also for the generic makers. Now, uh, I already said, in terms of cost, the importance that this will have. And if we go quickly to the next slide uh, here, you will uh, be in a position to identify how are we formally making this reform. Uh, you can click again, uh, exactly. Uh, no, the previous one. And here what you see is that this reform that we are proposing is actually composed of four regulations. For regulations, you will say, oh my God, this is complex, but this actually was the best um, legal technique uh, because we're having two regulations per sort of area. So one for medicinal products, one for uh, plant pr uh, protection products. And so for each area or scope, we're having two regulations, one amending the existing national schemes, and one introducing the national, uh, the unitary SPC, which requires obviously two different legal bases, as you can see uh, from the from the union treaty. So this is what we have proposed for regulations. And if you go to the next slide, you will see very quickly a very um, you can click several times. This is just 
for you a diagram of how it will work. So you have a centralized or unitary or combined SPC application. It will be uh, locked or you know, presented to the UIPO that will uh, handle the formal examination and the publication. Together with the national IP offices, it will have the substantive examination and then it will be either um, uh, implemented by or, or granted by the national IP offices in the case in the case of of a national SPC, or it will be granted directly by the EU IPO in the case of the unitary SPCs. Voila. This is all I wanted to say about SPCs. Um, happy to answer any question you may have. If we move on, though, for the second pillar of the patent package, I will briefly present the compulsory licensing initiative. So next slide, please. And next slide. So what is that we are doing on compulsory licensing? I think it's, it's, it's very important here, again, to explain what do we understand by compulsory licensing. I think it's basically the possibility for a government to allow a third party to use a, a patent without the explicit authorization of the right holder, obviously subject to a certain conditions. This is not no wild west. I mean, we are bound, obviously, by a legal uh, framework which is introduced by the international um, uh, trips. Uh, articles 31 and 31b. Uh, this is our legal framework. And um, basically, this use, so this compulsory licensing, uh, it's done under adequate conditions, uh, including uh, a compensation, a remuneration that has been uh, granted to the patent holder. Now, compulsory licensing is obviously uh, an area that can be uh, useful hmm, to provide access to to crisis critical goods and technologies during crisis time while preserving the incentive for innovation and this is what it is you know different from the discussion of having a full ip waiver which basically you know waives ip rights uh, without the necessary you know necessary procedure nor the necessary safeguards including the compensation so i think it's important to make that distinction we're talking about compulsory licensing not about ip waivers now if we uh, look at um, why we have introduced this initiative, also in the IP Action Plan from 2020, we already foresaw that the current system that we have today is unsatisfactory. So it's 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 not it's not sufficient. And why is that? Well, let me flag three uh, three uh, problems that we have identified. Well, the first one is that. At union level, we actually have um, very little legislation related to compulsory licensing. I mean, we don't have a right as union to actually uh, force uh, compulsory licensing in cases of uh, emergencies, obviously. There is uh, this uh, possibility, for example, uh, in the context of uh, plant uh, protection uh, varieties. Um, there is um, also a, a regulation which we are also amending uh, for export for third countries, but this is in a very specific uh, situation, you know, for uh, uh, developed uh, countries, uh, etc. And what we have seen is that in the in the case of you know emergency situations national uh, member you know national laws at union level actually foresee the possibility of using the um, uh, compulsory licensing but but the the frameworks that are established at union level are actually um, not uh, comparable. They don't necessarily foresee the same type of a scope. Uh, the, the administrative procedures uh, may be you know, different. They may not have the same scope in terms of what type of uh, IP right can be uh, uh, live, I mean, uh, subject to a compulsory licensing. And, and, and it's also a problem of territoriality, Rich, because of course, if you do have crises that are affecting several territories in the in the European Union that they, that can be con, you know considered an emergency crisis 
um, uh, with the national uh, compulsory licensing, you will not be able to actually ensure that uh, other territories will be affected by that national compulsory licensing. So there is no possibility to have actually compulsory licensing attaining the whole union territory. And moreover, because as you know very well, the, the Court of Justice has said that if there is no consent by the IP holder, there is no uh, exhaustion, so there is no free movement of compulsory licensing goods. So even if, let's say, France could issue compulsory licensing and would start producing, let's say, all in, in France, even if, for example, the manufacturing capacity could have been, you know, in, in, in the Netherlands or in another country, um, such type of product, uh, would be limited, could not necessarily circulate, so no free movement of goods within the union. And I think that's very important to have in mind uh, as a, as the why we are putting forward this uh, commission uh, proposal and um, what the main elements of it are. I think um, if we go to the next slide, you will see here a, a bit of the structure of the proposal that we are putting forward. Uh, and the main elements of it. I mentioned uh, the scope actually, uh, it's we're talking about covering uh, patents, but also utility models and, uh, and SPCs, uh, published patents. We are also uh, linking the triggering of the uh, application of the compulsory licensing, you know, making it subject to an EU existing crisis instrument. So we're talking about uh, only in the case where an existing union emergency instrument is put in motion, for example, the ERA uh, uh, instrument or the single market emergency instrument that you may have seen, it's still in its phase, in its last phases of codecision, or in the emergency sections of the CHIP Act. So only when, according to an existing union emergency instrument, uh, there, there's been a, um, a formulation that we are on an emergency crisis status, it can then only then start applying our compulsory licensing uh, proposal. So we do not, from our compulsory licensing proposal, decide when the emergency will be kicked out. Uh, it, it is always interconnected to that or the broader horizontal union uh, emergency crises. And what we have introduced, of course, is a, is a very transparent procedure uh, where we are uh, counting on an advisory body, be it from the other uh, EU crisis or uh, other um, or if, if need be, you know, calling in for, you know, with experts, uh, etc. We will be, of course, having conditions to issue the compulsory licensing. I, I've mentioned the compensation. We we have proposed making it at, at around four percent. Uh, there are, of of course, um, also uh, uh, involvement of the patent uh, holders if I, are identified so that they are well informed and and and, and engaged on. And important as to, to flag that this unitary sort of compulsory licensing scheme that we are rolling out is not replacing, not intending to harmonize or modify the existing national uh, laws on compulsory licensing. Claudia, I, can I just remind you about the time? It's uh, 12 minutes left in total. Okay, then I will finish with that, which is just the export to non-EU countries, uh, which is the additional amendment that we are doing uh, on the compulsory license system. And with that, I thank you all. Happy to have any answer and I, I any questions. And I pass on to my colleague Jonas for the standard essential patents. Yeah. Apologize for interrupting. It's so interesting. So I got lost as well. <laughs> Please no problem. Jonas. Yeah, you need to jump in still to two more slides. So one right, more, two more slides. There we go. Yes, so um, I have uh, just a little bit over 10 minutes um, that I'll use. I'm not sure whether we can actually get the questions unless uh, Henrik uh, would ex extend the time a bit. Um, I have to square the circle here today. As far as I know, there are people in, uh, listening in that are experts on, on SEPs and some that aren't. So I have to give a bit of background and then explain uh, uh, what we're doing. So there's three parts to this uh, short intervention. First, as you see here, uh, basically the background of SEPs, what they are and how they're relevant to our current uh, um, uh, um, 
um, economy. The second slide will be focused on the challenges that SEPs uh, basically uh, establish, both legally and economically. And then the third will be um, a bit of an overview of what we're doing to address these challenges. So the first slide, as you see here, what are standard essential patents? For those of you that do not know this, standard essential patents are essentially uh, patents that protect technology that are that is essential for the implementation uh, of a specific standard that will generally be um, implemented um, and agreed upon and adopted by a so-called standard developing organization. And such standards are generally um, related to uh, forms of connectivity. You will know the, the Gs, 3G, 4G, and 5G, but also Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Those are standards but also audio, video comprehension, uh, compression and, and decompression are standards that are set um, by, by SDOs and then encumber specific patents. So if I want to implement such a standard, I will necessarily infringe upon one of these patents and will then necessarily have to pay a license fee, license fee for it. And this SEPs market is actually um, not just uh, has not just been very relevant in the past, but it is increasing in its uh, in its relevance for our high uh, technology uh, era. Just some numbers you'll see here. I won't go into them uh, all. Um, what's really important to know is that um, from the year 2010 to, to the year 2020, we have a six-fold increase of SEPs uh, that have been declared to SDOs. Um, that is dramatic. Um, we um, know that there is a fragmentation of owners from just under 100 uh, that were large owners of SEP portfolios in 2010 to 260 and more today. That's a two and a half fold increase in fragmentation on the owner's side, but also on the implementer side, we see a fragmentation, which is basically due, due to the fact that today we have an Internet of Things, as you all know, with more and more um, products uh, being interconnected and being uh, produced by an, a large number of implementers rather than 10 or 15 years ago when we had some mobile uh, phone uh, producers that were basically implementing these, these SEPs. So there's an increase of fragmentation on the owner side, there's an increase of fragmentation on the implementer side, and there's a large increase just on the uptake of SEPs that are being declared. So we see that this, these markets to standardization are growing, they're growing fast, and as they are growing, we think from the commission that this growth is only outpaced by the public need to ensure that these statistics, these numbers are actually not inflated, that they're actually uh, factual, because we want to ensure that we pre prevent the uh, dead weight loss that is related to um, a, a large, uh, um, a too high number of, of steps being declared. And I'll get to the details in a second. So you can go on to the next slide. And just as a bit of a, a background, you can click twice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just as a bit of a background here, um, back in 2012, uh, this, um, this was a time uh, that we could call the antitrust era. In the United States, but also the EU Commission was focused more on the question of how do we deal with a specific monopoly that a standard essential patent provides? Because the standard essential patent not only is the exclusionary right of a patent, but it also leverages the entire, well, uh, the entire value of a standard. So back in 2012, we were focused with more providing guidance, voluntary guidance to SDOs. And, and that worked in a way because these, guys, these SDOs have in, included in their IPR policies and their bylaws contractual requirements for SEP owners to provide licenses based on FRAN uh, commitments, which I'm sure many of you know, FRAN means fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And the courts have followed suit. They have focused on ensuring that the way these negotiations work is actually a fair behavioral practice of all participants. But European courts don't, um, let's say, analyze whether the result of such negotiation actually is FRAN. So we think that there is a, a missing puzzle piece here, which is the question, are we ensuring that the framework conditions of FRAN negotiations are in fact fair so that the outcomes, however they go, can be in fact fair outcomes for all participants? And I just want to give some perspectives on issues here. I won't go into all of them because of, because of the time. But I, we think that these problems, the challenges of FRAND, really go both ways. So if you just look at the implementer side, one example here is 
that when, when an implementer is approached by a SEP owner to pay a certain license for a um, standard essential patent, that implementer will not even know today whether that SEP is in fact essential to the standard that it is being declared to. There's some numbers here. So for example, Etsy, which is a German, which is a European uh, um, uh, SDO focused on communication standards. There are estimates that only 25 to 40% of the, uh, of the SEPs declared to Etsy are in fact essential. So with respect to 5G, this is even more draft, drastic with an essentiality rate of only 15% being estimated currently. So there's a high amount of potential SEPs that are being declared and for which uh, license fees are being um, demanded, which in fact aren't actually essential to that, um, to that standard. That's a problem of over-declaration. It's a problem of transparency. Um, and I'll go on to the other side. So from the SEP owner side, we have another issue. We have an issue that SEP owners first won't even know who's implementing their SEPs, just, as I said, it's a very fragmented market. But they also have an issue with respect to the patent system as it is, as Claudia mentioned earlier, it's a national system. So patent implementers, SEP implementers, could require patent owners to enforce their SEPs in every single jurisdiction in which they are on the market. And that will incur litigation costs, that would take time, and that will lead to indeterminacy and, most of all, inefficiency. It's the so-called holdout problem. So the commission has gone about this for a long period of time from a voluntary perspective back with the communication in 2017. We implemented, we, we pre uh, presented the IP action plan in 2020. We had expert groups, essentiality check pilots. We had public consultations and webinars with stakeholders and identified that there are essentially transparency problems. There are problems of power asymmetry. There are problems of inefficiency and indeterminacy that we need to solve. So when we go to the last slide now, just a brief overview of what our regulation is trying to do here. Basically, we're trying to solve all these problems at once. Um, we have four pillars that um, this, this proposal basically um, consists of. So first, we are creating a competence center at the European Union Intellectual Property Office. The competence center, center is basically a coordination center for all, all the different tasks that we are proposing as policy solutions in this proposal. The first of this policy solution is the so-called centralized register. That's very critical to the transparency problem that I just mentioned. So all SEP owners will be required to register the SEPs that they want to enforce in the European Union to this register. That leads to the fact that only such SEPs that are in the register can be enforced before the courts. And what's connected to this register, which is really critical to our transparency issue, are so-called obligatory essentiality checks, will be based on a sample of SEPs. We will review a number of SEPs every year to ensure that the SEPs that are being registered are in fact essential to a standard. That also leads to an as incentive of SEP owners to only declare and register so, such SEPs that are in fact essential, which tries to solve the problem of over-declaration that I just mentioned. The next pillar is the so-called aggregate royalty determination process. This is a process which leads to a non-binding recommendation of an expert based on a review in which all stakeholders have agency to determine an aggregate royalty fee, a fee that should be, should, by the way, not binding, should be paid as a total sum for a standard, not determining how this total sum is then distributed amongst the SEP owners, but it will be a framework based on which negotiations can then be unfolded. And the final policy uh, uh, solution or proposal that we're adding to this regulation, and by that uh, I'll end here, is a so-called out-of-court dispute resolution system for FRAN determination licensing terms and conditions. So the idea here is that the participants of a normal FRAN negotiation will enter into a structured nine-month process, at the end of which there will be, again, a non-binding presentation of a FRAN licensing term to which both parties can either commit or not during the process. 
and only after which they can then try to seek um, uh, a legal um, uh, uh, um, uh, consolation before the courts. Um, so for this nine month period, there will not be the possibility to enforce a SEP um, um, in the courts. That's the idea because that leads to the, or that tries to ch solve the problem of power asymmetry that we have identified between the parties of a friend negotiation. So that is in a very simple and, uh, and over, broad overview of the regulation that we're proposing. It is currently um, tabled by the, by the commission. The co-legislators are discussing it. We are very interested and open uh, to hearing from stakeholders um, uh, their views on this and are, uh, of course, constructively um, uh, participating in, in, in the further process. Um, so thank you for allowing us to present this here. Thank you so much. So interesting and rewarding, I think, but also filled with content. <laughs> so most grateful here. Uh, I have plenty of questions, but we, we're running a bit short of time. So let's, if there is a, a question from the audience, maybe we could take that first as first priority. Let me see if I can read it here. How will all the competence center impact and interact with the many and growing numbers of patent pools uh, who already spend a lot of time doing essential checks and establish aggregate royalties based on market value? That's a very good question from Eugene Sweeney. Who's up to answer to that one. Jonas, you unmuted. <laughs> I, I'm happy to answer. Should I just answer that question or are there more so we please, join them up? Please take this okay. one. Well, I think that the, the, I'll make it really brief. I think in our view, patent pools are very critical and they are performing very important uh, work already in this, in this framework. Um, that, that's why we want um, one of the information that we want um, to be registered in the register is whether or not there are already patent pools engaging in, 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 this, in this ecosystem, because that's relevant to implementers to know. Once there is a patent pool, I have a clear addressee to which I can uh, um, um, address uh, my questions. And so we think that's really important. And we also know that they are, they are, they are performing essentiality checks, but the essentiality checks there are very different in the structure. What we think is really important to the essentiality checks is that A, they are independent, and B, they are highly qualitative because they generate trust of all stakeholders in the system. So we think that ultimately the EU IPO will need and should engage very constructively with patent pools. But we also think that there are simple tasks that patent pools leave unanswered, uh, which we are providing solutions for in our proposal. Excellent. And I think we actually have to break it there. Uh, Thank you so much for very interesting. And I would like to encourage you to attend ASTP annual conferences and also would like to encourage ASTP to set up courses around this and training around this and invite you as speakers there because our community is so much about interaction and we need to understand and learn from each other. So great job today and let's Let's take other questions online or in the next meeting. Okay. Yep. Unfortunately, I have to. Yeah. I mean, we we could we could reply, but I I understand we don't have time, so we're happy to do so uh, in writing if need be or in in next occasions. I think okay. so. We have to do it like that, uh, okay. being wary of uh, people's time and. True. So thank you once more. Excellent job. And, and looking forward to meet you in the future. <laughs> so, Christoph, over to you. Yes, well, that would be qu quite brief. I had some questions, but uh, I see we have no time, so I will ask the questions uh, in, in parallel after I may. Thanks a lot, um, Enrique, and thanks a lot for, for Hannah also for this very nice uh, moderation. And I think it was really uh, interesting, very I mean, insightful uh, presentations and exchange with the community. So I have to thank everybody. Uh, maybe the last uh, comment would be uh, if our members uh, would like us to cover 
other uh, EU-related topics, uh, we are very happy to consider proposals for the next forum. And um, this next forum, um, we are planning actually end of April or beginning of May next year, of course. So please uh, don't hesitate and just send us some messages about the, the topics you would like uh, to see addressed in the next forum. And I think that that's about it. So thanks a lot to um, everybody. Thanks to the technical uh, team, uh, Anwar, as usual. And um, I wish you a, a nice day and, uh, well, probably a nice Christmas, even if it's a bit early for that. So uh, thanks a lot to the community and uh, have a very nice day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.